Greetings, everybody. Uh, welcome to tonight's program. I'm Jean Rubin. I direct the Indigenous Film and Arts Festival, which is a program of the International Institute for Indigenous Resource Management. With me is Murph Tano, our Institute President. We present this monthly Indigenous film series with our partners, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science and the Denver American Indian Commission. I usually note that in addition to the folks you see on screen, there's a whole raft of folks uh, behind the scenes who help make these programs possible. Tonight, uh, several of the folks that you are accustomed to seeing on screen are under the weather. Uh, they did not want to be, uh, we did not want to make them uh, come on camera coughing and sneezing, <laughs> but they are with us behind the scenes helping to make it possible. So our thanks to all of the DMNS staff uh, and we give you our best wishes to get well soon. Uh, with us tonight on screen uh, is Raven Payment, a commissioner with the Denver American Indian Commission, to say a few words of welcome. Raven? Great, thank you. Buju and Danawe Maganaguk Anin. What I just said there is Ojibwe for hello, all of my relatives. Um, I am Raven Payment, and I am Ojibwe and Ghanaian Gahaga, which is more commonly known as Mohawk. I am a commissioner with the Denver American Indian Commission, and on behalf of our commission, and also in coordination with this film festival and people like Jean and Merv, um, I'm really honored to welcome you all to tonight's film, Blackbird, and also a live discussion um, with Adam Miller and Merv. Um, Chi Miigwech, which means thank you um, for being here with us tonight, and I hope you enjoy the film. I'm very excited. Thank you. Thank you, Raven. Thank you. Uh, I also want to thank this year's media sponsor, Kulo Jazz Radio. And we want to give a special shout out to the film director, Amy Batalabasi, and the film dis distributor, Ronan Films, for making it possible for us to present this virtual screening tonight. Uh, Amy has uh, also asked me to note that this is a one-time screening and no recording of the film is permitted by anyone in the audience. So we will start tonight's program with a screening of Black Blackbird. It's a 13 minute documentary, no, not documentary, docudrama. Uh, after the film, Merv will start the discussion and we'll introduce our guest speaker, Adrian Miller. So uh, let's roll the film and we'll see you on the other side. Okay, so, um, before we, we get into the discussion, let me just remind folks that you can be posting your um, questions and comments in the chat room at any time. Uh, so Merv, you wanna get us started? Sure. Uh, I also posted in the chat a, a couple of uh, uh, links uh, to uh, uh, some books. Uh, one by Sydney Mintz on, uh, on uh, social impact of sugar very good it's kind of a uh, classic and the other one was uh, relatively new to me uh, university of hawaii publication about plantation and and labor uh, uh again a very good uh, good work on the uh, uh, the labor issues related to uh, uh to plantations and speaking of plantations i never worked on a plantation but my father did, and um, my uh, great grandmother did, and uh, there were plantations in Hawaii. Uh, father came from the Philippines. Grandma, great grandmother came from uh, Puerto Rico, and uh, as a result, uh, here I am, sitting here in Denver. <laughs> so. You know, we, we, we sometimes think of these uh, uh, experiences that were uh, portrayed in the, uh, in the film of Blackbird, Blackbird as, a, uh, as, as kind of an artifact of history, uh, nothing to do with today. But yet, <laughs> it is here with us, uh, here and now. Uh, every time we eat, there's a possibility uh, 
that what we're eating is a result of slave labor, or if not slave labor, some pretty abusive labor practices. I'll just give you a couple of examples. Anybody that traveled through the south of Spain sees those miles and miles and miles of greenhouses. Well, somebody's got to pick all that stuff in those greenhouses. And a lot of folks come from Africa. A lot of people come from uh, uh, Eastern Europe. And uh, they're pretty much treated like crap, OK? Uh, during the uh, uh, COVID, poor uh, uh, guys that were there, they had they were living in shacks of uh, cardboard and plastic and uh, uh, no water. Uh, it was it's just just pathetic. Uh, shrimp, love shrimp. But every time I eat shrimp, I'm thinking, God, you know, was this peeled by some Burmese slave of a Thai shrimp producer? Um, the uh, a lot of fish we get is uh, caught by uh, Chinese uh, fishers. And uh, in many instances, these are uh, crewed by, uh, by slave, practically slave labor, All right? Very abusive practices. Uh, uh, you've got situations where uh, um, they die and they just, tossed off the, uh, the boat uh, as uh, almost like chum for the uh, uh, for the sharks that they're uh, uh, catching for the for their uh, uh, fins. So uh, so let, let's be aware that these are not ancient practices. Uh, they're happening uh, uh, today. Now, there's another thing about this uh, film that I think is uh, interesting uh, because uh, we think of uh, there's a story of, uh, of, of, of two young people from the Solomon Islands. All right. Uh, there's a tendency, I think, on a part from uh, uh, in North America to think of the Solomon Islands. Well, it's some sort of uh, uh, you know unitary place, uh, maybe a couple of uh, islands like the Arch Hawaiian archipelago, <laughs> and far from, uh, they got 900 islands spread all over the place. Uh, and there are 50, 60, uh, up to 70 different languages spoken on these islands, which means they have 50, 60, 70 unique cultures different from island to island, and even within the larger islands, uh, uh, differences. Uh, so, which is to say that uh, the story here of Blackbird is a grim one. There's no gain saying the, 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 that's the, the the grim business of these plantations uh, in in Australia and earlier on uh, in, in the Americas. But these diasporas, <laughs> for me, they're an existential uh, benefit. Without those uh, diasporic uh, movements of folks from Puerto Rico, folks from Philippines, Murph Tunnel doesn't exist. And, and so, uh, again, there's nothing uh, that you can uh, kind of uh, say that's great about these, uh, these movements, but they do result in the blending, the mixing of cultures that's reflected in places like Fiji, places like Hawaii, uh, uh, in, in the Caribbean with unique cultures, the kind of multicultural culture. Uh, and so 
these are the stories that are very often not not told. And, uh, uh, what we're going to talk about uh, this evening is, uh, you know, one facet of uh, of this blending, of this mixing, of this multiculturalism. Uh, our conversation, though, we're not going to focus on the, uh, the, the grim aspects of, uh, of these diasporic movements, uh, but on the cultural aspects, uh, and more specifically, the cuisines that were created. So with that, I'd like to uh, ask Jean to uh, introduce a great friend, great scholar, and a hell of a nice guy. <laughs> Thank you. It is truly a pleasure to introduce Adrian Miller. Adrian is a food writer, James Beard Award winner, attorney, and certified barbecue judge who lives in Denver, Colorado. That's right. He is featured in the Netflix hit High on the Hog, How African American Cuisine Transformed America. Adrian has an undergraduate degree in international relations from Stanford and a JD from Georgetown University. I met Adrian 20 years ago through the Stanford. Yeah, 20 years. <laughs> Isn't that something? <laughs> you didn't know you were that old, huh? I didn't. I didn't. 20 years ago through the Stanford Alumni Association when he started organizing his cheap eats events at local barbecue restaurants. Adrian always took time to talk about the food we were enjoying, uh, giving us insights into the history and regional differences of barbecue and soul food. So it was no surprise to me when he published his first book, Soul Food, The Surprising Story of an American Cuisine, One Plate at a Time. In 2014, with his first book, Adrian won the James Beard Foundation Award for Scholarship and Reference. His second book, The President's Kitchen Cabinet, The Story of the African Americans Who Have Fed Our First Families, from the Washingtons to the Obamas, was published actually on President's Day in 2017. It was a finalist for both the 2018 NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Literary Work in the Nonfiction category and the 2018 Colorado Book Award for History. This year, Adrian once again took home the James Beard Award for Reference History and Scholarship with his third book, Black Smoke, African Americans and the United States of Barbecue. Black Smoke also won this year's Colorado Book Award for History, and it is nominated for the International Association of Culinary Professionals Literary and Historical Writing Award. So as you can see, I am not the only fan of Adrian's writing. If you think reading about food is interesting, you will want to read these books. If you don't think reading about food is interesting, start with one of Adrian's books and you will change your mind. He is a fantastic writer. They are a great read and widely available from booksellers and on his, wives, uh, his website. Uh, the book titles and his website are posted in the chat room. So since he will not shamelessly promote his work, I will. <laughs> Buy a book, they are great. So with that, Reverend, I will turn it back to you to start with some questions for Adrian. Okay. I should also add that he cooked good, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I got some skills. I got some skills. He got some skills. He, uh, you like cornflakes? <laughs> he was cajoled into showing up in my kitchen with his cast iron skillet in hand and cooked some great soul food. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm so just thanks for inviting me. And I'm so honored to be with you all tonight. Thanks to everybody who's joined us. And I'm just looking forward to a great conversation and to get questions from people who are uh, listening to this. So thank you. Yeah, let's let's start this uh, conversation, uh, uh, Adrian, with uh, a brief discussion of uh, the Middle Passage and, uh, if you will, the uh, triangular uh, trade route, uh, especially focusing on those ships that went from uh, the Americas uh, to Europe. Yeah. Yeah. So the Middle Passage is a coin term that emerges during the Atlantic slave trade era. Um, and uh, it describes uh, what I'll do is I'll talk about each leg and please 
add on if I, if I don't forget. So I want to start with West Africa. So most people of African heritage in uh, the United States, we trace our roots to that part of Africa. There were some enslaved people from different parts of Africa, East Africa, but most come from West Africa. So the Middle Passage is the coin term for that or nickname for the journey across the Atlantic Ocean which depending on where you left uh, in Africa and where you were going in the Americas could be anywhere from 10 to 12 weeks. Uh, an estimated 10 to 12 million enslaved West Africans made this journey. We don't know exactly for sure because records weren't you know, adequately kept, but that's the estimate that most uh, historians agree upon. And um, you know, for enslaved Africans on this route, they were the cargo. Uh, their bodies were brought to the Americas to do work. Uh, and it was forced labor. And another thing that's um, to note is that uh, a lot of African foods were brought across the Atlantic as well to provision these slave ships. Uh, in the early years of the slave trade, the enslaved were fed basically rotten European food. And the mortality rates got so high that uh, slaveholders and slavers had to change their st strategy because again, they had to have enough of this human cargo make it across the Atlantic Ocean so they could make some money. So uh, we've got ingredients like okra, black eyed peas, watermelon, a, a type that was an African type of rice, sesame seeds, uh, other things made their way across the uh, Atlantic. So they get to the Atlantic, typically going to the Caribbean or South America. Brazil was the country that got the most enslaved Africans. Of the uh, number that went across the Atlantic, only about 4% go to British North America, what would eventually become United States and Canada. I don't think a lot of people know that. So um, these ships would uh, unload the human cargo, these enslaved West Africans, and then they would pick up sugar. Um, they would pick up molasses, tobacco, all these things that were cultivated in the Caribbean or in South America. And sometimes the triangular trade would be rectangular. They might head to the 13 British colonies first before heading back to Europe. Um, and if they did that, if they picked up in the colonies, they would get, um, you know, uh, in addition to, sorry, I forgot to mention rum is one of the uh, things that were there, but a lot of manufactured goods, cloth and stuff was sent back to Europe. And then Europe would take these raw ingredients or some of the things uh, finished in the Americas and they would turn, they would sell or turn them into textiles, uh, metals, firearms, um, alcoholic beverages and all that stuff. And then that would go to the colonial um, presence in West Africa. So you see this movement of people and goods and ingredients, foods, all of these things happening uh, in the Atlantic Ocean for over a course of several centuries. Yeah. Let, let me uh, kind of move to uh, this movement because people were coming from West Africa uh, and now we're Mercator projection people, so we have a really distorted view of uh, <laughs> how big Africa is. Uh, and, and so there's uh, uh, people are coming over, and like the Solomon Islands, I mean, this is bigger than the Solomon Islands. It's much more diverse than the Solomon Islands. So people are coming in from different cultures, different ethnic groups, different. Uh, uh, different belief systems, different cuisines. Uh, so, you know, you've, you've participated in some of our workshops and our roundtables. So you know that one of the things I rant about is this uh, tendency we have of, uh, what happened there? Of uh, kind of creating these huge uh, categories like African-American or West African or Asian American, when, when, when what you're talking about are hundreds of millions of people, thousands of different uh, different people, different cultures, different foods, and then we lump them all together just for kind of an administrative convenience. Uh, so, so when things get mixed up as a result of this diaspora, they're not coming from, take one from, uh, you know, A side of the menu and B side of the menu and come up with a, 
seaside of, a, of a, you know, some sort of combination. There's a not maybe not infinite, but it's a broad it's a, of uh, broad base of uh, of foodstuffs, of techniques, etc. So can can you tell us a bit about what results from that kind of diversity here in the uh, in North America or or the Caribbean, the Americas? Yeah, yeah. So I think one thing that's important to understand is despite slavers and slaveholders attempts to just stamp out the humanity of these people, you know, they assert it. And um, the migrant story, whether voluntary or forced, is when you get to the new place, you try to recreate home. And if you can do it with the exact same things from back home, you do. But often you're in a new environment and you have to find substitutes and then you're encountering new people. And you're starting to learn from them how to use uh, what's available in the local larder and how to come up with dishes and stuff. So we, we see this process happening. Some people call that creolization, uh, but you, you see this kind of fusion and thing happening from the earliest days when um, enslaved Africans arrive in the Americas. And I think one of the things that's been tremendously lost over time is the Native American, the indigenous people, their contributions and how they were the foundation of so many of these foods that we love. Like I talk about the Native American Foundation for Southern Food, um, which has been really obscured, um, and also barbecue. Uh, and so we, we see these things happening. So I'll, I'll give you a few examples. So um, let's talk about barbecue for a second. When uh, Europeans come, and this is actually before the slave trade is in, in full um, gear, but when Europeans come to the Americas, they see this type of cooking that they've never really seen before. And um, the word barbecue is an approximation of what the indigenous people were calling the frame of sticks on which the meat was being cooked over a slow fire. So it wasn't even about the cooking process or the meat itself, but it was really just that wooden frame. And it was called barbacoa in Spanish. And then a game of historical telephone happens and then it becomes barbecue in English. But we find that with this foundation of how uh, indigenous people were preparing meat in a way that it wasn't fast for immediate consumption and it was more towards the preservation um more towards the end of preserving it for later use europeans see this and enslaved africans see it they bring their own meat smoking traditions and meat preparation traditions and then they bring uh, additional animals you know mainly from europe and then this intermediate type of cooking evolves and i i go out of my way to say that that is Native American in its foundation. Now, believe me, when I started my work, I wanted to prove that it was West African in origin in terms of talking about barbecue. Do this and say Wakanda forever, but you know, I gotta follow <laughs> the facts. And um, you know, the historical sources point to that. Uh, another example is the dish succotash. So things like maize, beans, and other things from the Americas, West Africans throw in some okra. And then eventually uh, succotash becomes a signature Southern dish. So we see a lot of examples of that. And, and one other example I'd say would, would be gumbo. So gumbo, the name for it is for, uh, it, it, it's an approximation of the word in several West African societies for okra, but it's this stew. Um, and one of the hallmarks of having a great okra is to have it thickened by something. And so West Africans would use okra because it's got a slimy texture that comes out when you cook it. But Native Americans would do something, they, they call it filet powder, but it would be essentially sassafras leaves that are dried and crushed, and that could be added to gumbo as well. So you wouldn't have a gumbo with both of those things, but you have this soup, this stew that's beloved by so many that has a nod to Africa as well as a nod to indigenous culture with an intermixing of kind of European techniques. So I, I tell people, for example, that soul food is the blending of the culinary ingredients and techniques of West Africa, Western Europe, and the Americas. All of these things coming together in the American South. And you see a similar um, effect in the Caribbean and South America. The main difference though, is I would say that when you get to point South the United States, in terms of the African-American story or the enslaved African story, those foods tend to be more reminiscent of what people had in West Africa because of similarity and climate and also because the way slavery operated in the Caribbean and in South America, enslaved people had a lot more autonomy over their food uh, choices, even under these horrific circumstances, 
they were allowed to garden. Um, and people in North America were allowed to do this too, but you could, uh, you could have a more direct transplantation of um, transplanting of uh, African ingredients. So I tell people that in British North America, it was a European meal with West African influences. But when you get to Point South, it's more of a West African meal with European influence in terms of the way these cuisines play out over time. So within the United States, uh, uh, Adrian, uh, how are, if you will, uh, kind of discrete regional uh, cuisines, uh, yeah. Do they have them, and 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 uh, what's their uh, genesis, if you will? So the beginning story is, at least in what would eventually become the United States, is the Chesapeake Bay area. So that's that's the first place where we have this coming together of indigenous, European, and African um, peoples. And um, it's interesting that we don't talk about the Chesapeake Bay today as a recognized kind of regional food area because the food was so dang good that they overate. They overexploited the Chesapeake Bay. So a lot of that stuff just kind of, by the time you get to the late 19th century, those things are just less available. Um, but you've got, um, to tell the story, you go from Virginia, where it's kind of the foundational um, state or area for Southern food. And then you've got the Carolinas, um, kind of the coastline, really from Virginia to Northern Florida, that's called the Low Country. But today we most associate the Low Country with the Carolinas, especially South Carolina. But there, it was more about rice farming. So West Africans with specific knowledge in rice farming were brought here to create a very lucrative industry. And the way that rice is cultivated, it wasn't like cotton and tobacco. And so it was more of something called the task system. So enslaved people were given a task and depending on how quickly they finished it, they had a certain amount of leisure time. And so the argument here is that in that part of the South, because of the way slavery played out, there was more autonomy over their food system. So it's a more Africanized um, cuisine than what you find in other parts of the South. So Gullah and Geechee are often the uh, labels that are um, given to the people of African descent in that part of the South. And you see stronger African culinary and cultural survivals in dress, speech, and in the food. Uh, one example would be something like uh, shrimp and grits or catfish and grits. So uh, even though maize was not available in Africa during the early years of the slave trade, it certainly was later. And um, being a, a coastal area, people were often combining uh, seafood with starches because the typical West African meal is some kind of savory soup, stew, or sauce served alongside or on top of a starch. So this combination of this savory thing with a you know with a spicy sauce or whatever with something like grits, a starch uh, makes total sense in the African culinary equation. So you see that as an example. Another example is Creole. So you have this specifically Spanish and French influence in the Lower Mississippi Valley but the European uh, influence is stronger there. So that is a way that the cuisine plays out differently. Um, when people talk about Cajun, I think the difference between Cajun and Creole is the difference between city food and kind of country cooking. Um, but you see a stronger kind of French influence there. So the, the cuisine plays out differently because you have a different set of Europeans that set the kind of the strongest influence. Um, and then I, I think the other one that I would like to mention is this area in the deep South. So the Deep South is where slavery was most concentrated by the time we get to uh, where slavery is really about uh, cultivating cotton. And so there was a broad swath through the South, Mississippi, uh, Alabama, Georgia, that part. And so that cuisine, I think, is different. And I think that's what most people think of when they think of Southern food. So you certainly have uh, a European interest uh, influence and African influence and indigenous influence, but they seem to be more intermingled in the deep South uh, than you see in these other places. And then my argument is that soul food is what black migrants took out of the South, the deep South and transplanted in other parts of the countries and started this whole process of fusion again, because they were exposed to different people once they got outside of the South. Uh, so. The uh, you said uh, 
at the beginning, uh, there's no corn in Africa. Uh, at the beginning, there's no corn in Europe. Uh, so one of the things that uh, is, uh, I think, interesting is the, uh, when we talk about the Colombian exchange, uh, we normally think of uh, uh, tomatoes going to, uh, <laughs> to Italy and uh, uh, potatoes going to Ireland. Uh, but it's a lot more complicated than that. Uh, so can, can you tell us a, a, a bit about, if you will, the Colombian exchange as it relates to the kind of uh, uh, exchange of, uh, of food stuff between Africa and uh, uh, the uh, uh, Americas and how that's reflected in the cuisine of, of Africa, let's say. Yeah, so it's really interesting. So a lot of these things that just, uh, you know, make a big splash in Europe did so in Africa as well. I mean, just to back up, can we imagine Irish food without potatoes or Italian food without tomatoes? Right, right. Or, yeah. yeah. So um, I think what's interesting with West Africa is a lot of this is just kind of uh, substitutions of traditional foods. So I'll give you an example, the sweet potato native to the Americas gets introduced to West Africa. And uh, it didn't have the greatest reputation in a lot of places. It was often called the white man's yam. Um, and one of the things that happens in uh, United States here is we call dark flesh sweet potatoes yams. Public service announcement that they are not the same thing. They're completely different plants. Uh, the sweet potatoes as yams in the United States was just a marketing ploy by some uh, Louisiana farmers that causes a lot of confusion to this day. But eventually the sweet potato does grow in popularity. Sweet potato greens, the leaves of sweet potatoes are something that's very popular in several West African um, societies. So that's one example. Another yeah, is chilies. Filipinos too. Oh, Filipinos, okay. Another <laughs> one is chilies, right? So West Africans, prefer, prior to the Columbia Exchange, West Africans were used to warming spices that were quite popular. So cardamom and ginger. So that was already a feature of their local food. So then you get this supercharged uh, you know, ingredient that really adds the spice level. And so West Africans just fell in love with it. And it's hard to imagine West African cuisine not being spicy. Um, and then tomatoes, you see a lot of tomatoes in West African cuisine as well. And I think the last example I'll give are, are peanuts. So in West Africa, ground nuts were already popular but the introduction of peanuts, again, native, something native to the Americas, um, becomes a widely popular substitute for ground nuts. So much so that a lot of times you, you see people using peanuts rather than the native ground nuts. And I think that a lot of that had to do with yields in terms of cultivation and other things. And then maize gets introduced and it's, it's widely popular as well. So uh, a lot of foods from the Americas um, become uh, integrated into West African uh, food traditions. One of the things that uh, happens uh, with lots of uh, kind of cultural manifestations uh, is that the, uh, the origins uh, of the uh, these cultural manifestation, whether it's music, uh, fashion, uh, and, and food, get uh, erased. Uh, and so <laughs> I, I, I wanted to, to ask you something that uh, uh, was kind of uh, out of left field, but uh, this iconic image of the mammy as being symbolic of Southern food uh, operates at, at several different kind of levels, right? Uh, so you want to talk about uh, kind of manifestations of power. Uh, yeah. Uh, but can you, one of the things that is, uh, for me, uh, a major problem is uh, that it serves also as a means of erasing right. the origins. So can you speak a little bit of that about why this is something like uh, Aunt Jemima, uh, Uncle Ben, uh, become this uh, symbols of Southern uh, dining? 
Yeah. And I'm going to borrow a lot from the thoughts of Tony Tipton Martin, who wrote a wonderful book called The Jemima Code. So you will find what's a lot, much of what I'm about to say here. So, yeah, this mammy figure is this uh, stereotypically, uh, you know, obese, Afri enslaved African-American woman or recently emancipated African-American woman who is so loyal to the family, but she rules the kitchen with an iron fist and she kept all of the family members in line. So she was this empowered figure. Um, who really didn't have power, right? But it was created. And a, a lot of these things like Aunt Jemima, Uncle Ben, the racist stereotypes about African-Americans with chicken, watermelon, a lot of these emerge post-emancipation. Um, and so the the Civil War was lost, but the lost cause wasn't. And even though um, the South was defeated, quote unquote, they launched a cultural war that lasted decades and uh, assisted in systematically undermining the rights of African-Americans. So uh, the Mammy figure and Aunt Jemima is the most, the recently retired, Aunt Jemima is the most famous example of this, um, are become these caricatures that people that could be made fun of, but the creation of these figures has several consequences. So one is this idea that black people are natural cooks, um, and they are uh, their purpose is servitude because unlike today, the foodie times of today, cooking was not something that was seen as glamorous for a lot of people. It was a badge of servitude. And so the idea was that black folks were naturally born to do this. And what does that mean? That undermines the skill that African Americans brought to this particular thing. It, 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 it wipes that all away. And the second thing is by focusing it on African Americans, it, off, it uh, obscures the contributions of Native Americans who were uh, you know, vital to this. And we, we see it most pronounced in barbecue because by the time you get to the mid 1800s, people aren't even talking about Native Americans uh, that much anymore when it comes to barbecue, even though in the early centuries of barbecue, they called it cooking the Indian way. Um, and so you see this vanishing of uh, African American, or sorry, Native Americans and this kind of empowering of African Americans in a false sense. And then the other thing is they get commodified, right? Uncle Ben and Aunt Jemima are here to sell you something. And so there's two things going on there. One is a sense of nostalgia for this lost era when black people were clearly servants and there was nothing they could do about it. And then there's this message that, hey, if a slave can make that, you can make this too. And so you see all of those things happening with uh, the, the mammy figure and these others. And the other, and then the final thing I'll say is uh, and I, I get this today, actually, to this day, when I am on the lecture circuit, undoubtedly somebody will come up afterwards and talk about this uh, beloved African-American cook or servant in the family and how they loved her. And then when you start pressing for details like, oh, yeah, what was her family like or anything else? They don't have a clue. So it was clearly a one sided relationship. You know, this person was here to serve me. Oh, yeah, we love them. But was there any love extended back to that person? No. <laughs> well, so uh, we have a couple of questions from Helen. One, just in the vein of what you were talking about, uh, she wants to know if there were ever enslaved men who served as cooks in the, in the U.S. And then let me just give you the second question as well. Uh, hearkening back to the intermingling of foods and cooking methods, uh, she wants to know, would peach cobbler be an example? And could you uh, speak about the source and evolution of that? And who brought the spices? Yeah. So that first question of enslaved men, yes, there were enslaved men who did cook, um, but it was usually in very limited circumstances. It was usually women's work to do the cooking. And so where we had men doing the cooking was barbecue. Um, even though there was some, some women did it to some extent, B enslaved black men, they were the ones that did barbecue. And it was quite an endeavor because old school barbecue is this, you had to get a clearing, you had to clear all the rocks out, make it a presentable place to have the barbecue. You had to chop down trees, chop that wood up, dig a trench, a couple feet deep, a few feet wide, burn down the wood in that trench until it was coals. Then you had to butcher the animals that you were going to cook um, and process them and butterfly them. Somebody had to flip them. Someone had to sauce them while cooking so they remain moist. Somebody had to serve them and do the entertaining and all that kind of stuff. So it was a black experience from beginning to end. And usually black men were the ones that were doing the cooking. And then there were also a number of black men who were um, forced to cook 
for military, uh, for soldiers. So usually in the military, um, the black there were men that were cooking. And then there were hunting expeditions and other things where black men cooked. So given the gender roles of the 19th century, if it looked like it was a man's outing or man's work, usually the enslaved cook was um, a man. Anything that was considered domestic uh, usually was a woman. And I will say the only other example I can think of, and this is just because I wrote a book about it, you had a number of enslaved men who were presidential cooks. So I think in some of the very, very wealthy household, they might have a man cooking, um, and it just kind of depends. But there, most of the cooks in White House history were Black women, uh, and a fair number were enslaved because we had so many slaveholding presidents. Um, in terms of peach cobbler, here's the interesting thing about the early history of peach cobbler. Um, the way that peach cobblers were made in the mid 19th century when this type of dessert emerges is people often threw the whole peaches in there with some butter and some sugar. Um, there might be some cinnamon and other things, but these were exotic spices obviously coming from either the Caribbean or from Asia through trade. Um, so they were usually using those pits to flavor it. Now, I think this is dangerous because you could choke on that pit, but that's how they made it. But here's the interesting thing. Towards the end of the 19th century, as uh, stove technology improves and other things, people started making these peach cobblers in ovens and they took the pits out and cut the peaches. And that's when you start to see rose water, almond extract, and other ingredients asked, um, added. And I think that was a cook's attempt to try to recreate the flavor that was once imparted by the pits when left in the peach cobbler. Hmm. But other, in terms of the spices, uh, you know, pretty, pretty much when people are making a peach cobbler, they're either using cinnamon or nutmeg. There may be allspice, which, you know, those with the nutmeg comes from, but um, it's pretty much cinnamon or nutmeg, and we know that those Caribbean and Asian spices. So in your uh, work, uh, is, there, is there another one there? Yeah, oh. I think this one's for you, Murph. Yeah. Uh, so this, this is going hearkening back to the film, um, asking about the history of the Torres Strait people uh, saying Australia doesn't acknowledge its historical slavery. Uh, the film was tragic. What was the significance of scenes at the ocean? Um, I think just from what I what interviews and things I've read uh, by the filmmaker, I can I can speak to scenes at the ocean. It was that you know that longing at the ocean, looking back right. to the islands where they came from. So it was that that sense of longing uh, for home. Uh, Murph, you, can you weigh in on the, the Torres Strait? <laughs> Well, the Torres Strait, uh, I, I, I really don't know that much about the uh, Torres Strait people. So, uh, I have a spell. But if we're talking about the folks in the Solomon Islands, I mean, uh, who figured in this, this uh, film, uh, this is a very <sighs> complicated, complex uh, uh, phenomenon. These blackbirders, some of them were uh, slavers. They, uh, they raided the islands and scooped up people uh, forcibly or uh, with the pretense that uh, they could come on board, et cetera, et cetera, uh, for, for trinkets. Australia will argue that these were not slaves, right? Because they were not the property, they were not property of plantation owners. Uh, and they were paid a salary, a pittance, but they were paid a salary. And they came for a determinate period, uh, after which they had the option of, of returning home. Some returned home. Some found it difficult to return home uh, because in the, in the seven ensuing years, things had changed. They had changed. They had seen uh, 
a different world, had interacted with different people. And all of a sudden, one of these uh, uh, little islands wasn't big enough for them, wasn't exciting enough. And sometimes they were coming back uh, with uh, wives or spouses that were from another island or an, even another island group. And that was in a traditional society, not all that keen. So you had people who re-upped, would sign up for uh, a, another stint, sometimes up to a seven-year contract. Um, here's the, the ugly part of it, right? is that uh, at some point they said we're not going to do this anymore uh, Australia and uh, we don't want you people here we've uh, industrialized we've mechanized the uh, uh, sugar uh, production and now we don't need you and so you got to go back and we're going to deport you because we have a white Australia policy. <laughs> you ain't that. Now, interestingly, part of the kind of fusion of cultures involved the marriage of folks from, for example, the Solomons with Aboriginal Australians. And that uh, gave them the kind of standing to say, no, we're not going to be, we're not going to be deported if they wanted to stay there. So uh, it's an, it, there's some interesting dynamics that, that, that take place uh, with the uh, Pacific Islanders and uh, Australia. For example, these folks who came are not called Pacific Islanders. They're called uh, what? What's the name? Australian Solomon Islanders. Uh, uh, yeah, something like Australian Solomon Islanders, uh, to distinguish themselves from the uh, the later wave of uh, of uh, Polynesians, especially who came from Samoa, Tonga, uh, and, and New Zealand, and have. Uh, uh, taken up residency uh, in uh, in Australia. You know, the Mazis are Maoris who uh, moved to Australia. Uh, and, uh, you know, took up Australian rules football. But I digress. <laughs> uh, so uh, it, it's, it's, it's a complex situation, uh, more nuanced uh, than to say, uh, they, they they were slaves. So, I'm gonna just weigh in briefly on this this all white policy. You know that's not that that's a pretty modern thing. Um, oh yeah. I I grew up in the D.C. area when I was in college. So talking about 1970 to 72, I had a summer job downtown, and at some point I met this nice fellow who worked at the Australian Embassy. And we were sitting and chatting, and he said, "Oh, you should come to Australia." He said, "You know, you can you can get your way paid if you go and you teach." And he said, "But of course, it's a you know, it's a white only policy. You had to be white to get the transportation to to go and teach. I mean, if you provide your own transportation, you had to be white to go." And I got to tell you, all of a sudden. This this uh, this interesting guy with the fabulous Australian accent became anathema to me, and that relationship went nowhere. <laughs> but I mean, it was it was it was a shock. But this is 1970, 1972. Um, so these policies, some of these uh, policies that we think of as you know ancient history, are not so ancient. This is uh, somewhat related, uh, but uh, uh, tangential. Uh, in terms of slavery, the folks that came, in my view, came close to being slaves were some of the Aboriginal who were uh, working for the 
cattle ranches. So, and they were certainly displaced and, uh, and, and much abused. Uh, that uh, film uh, with Alan Rickman and uh, Tom Selleck is not far from the truth. Hmm. No, there was a, what was that called? Well, Quigley Down Under. Uh, yeah. That, uh, uh, the massacre of uh, Aboriginals happened uh, uh, quite a bit there in Australia. You know, one of the most eye opening um, things from my research, which is a, you just know, you know, you don't learn this in school, is the, the way that Indigenous people were enslaved here before we transitioned, we, this country, transitioned to African slavery. I just had no idea about that. Right, 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 right. There's uh, uh, Pequots uh, that were, <laughs> you know, as a, as a, I think as a result of the King Philip War, uh, mm -hmm. you know, were, were, were shipped to the uh, Caribbean as yeah. slaves. Yeah. Uh, and it, it took years for them to, uh, to return home. Hey, somebody is messing with me in the chat. So I, I want to purposely ignore a certain question about key lime pie, Andrea. So. <laughs> All right, but we have a question. We have a question that's not messing with you. We have a good question here. Uh, someone wanting to know if there are foods or dishes that were eaten or prepared by Africans 100 to 200 years ago that have not survived today. Oh, that's really interesting. So, um, yeah, yeah I, I cannot answer that question um, thoroughly with Africans. I can tell you about African-American dishes because I've just studied that more closely. And the other thing is one of the things about this uh, early history of food is just a lot of this stuff was not well documented because, you know, just a lot of people just didn't, it wasn't, they didn't pay attention to it or it wasn't important. So I can tell you with African-Americans, uh, certain dishes that are not popular today or have disappeared are usually wild game dishes. So a hundred years ago, the African-American dish, if you were going to show off, you know, have lived a good life would be possum and taters. So that's roasted opossum with sweet potatoes. Mm -hmm. That was the preeminent dish. I, I don't know anybody. I know some people probably do eat it, but I just don't know anybody who does. And I actually want to try it, um, see what it's like. Another is terrapin, uh, which was a turtle um, in the Chesapeake Bay area. It was the Epicure's dish. Uh, and it started out as uh, food for enslaved people. Uh, you may not know this, but uh, enslaved people were given controlled amounts of food every week uh, by the slaveholder. And it was a way to display power. Um, and lobster and turtles were some of the things that enslaved people got, so much so that they complained, like with lobster, enslaved people complained that they were getting too much lobster. And we completely think about lobster a different way today. Um, and another dish that's uh, on the baking side that just doesn't, seems like it disappeared entirely was something called sweet potato pone. Uh, and pone is a, a nod to an indigenous word for a type of bread that was made. Um, but this one was made with sweet potatoes and it was kind of, uh, it was not quite a sweet potato casserole, but along that route and, um, you know, nobody, nobody really knows how to make it now. I've been trying to find somebody that makes it, and uh, it seems like it's a vanishing dish. So um, there are examples of foods like that, but I just can't give you a great answer on the African side, um, with the exception of one. Uh, there is a reddish African rice that's native to kind of Senegal. If you look at the west coast of Africa, from Senegal to Sierra Leone is rice going country, and they had a reddish rice that grew there. And the West Africans um, knew how to grow that rice. They were brought here to grow other varieties of rice. But there was a, an attempt to actually grow that rice here uh, along the coastline of the Atlantic. And uh, it thrived for a little while, but it just they weren't able to sustain it. So that's the only concrete example I can think of. Um, and just to address Andrea, uh, I don't know the history of key lime pie, but I like eating it. But I'm more of a fan of a lemon icebox pie, which I think is a a nice innovation of the key lime pie. So we're uh, we're getting close to the end of the program. So uh, wondering, Adrian, if you can uh, talk a little bit about uh, what's next on your plate. It oh, thank you. I should make you my publicist. Uh, all right. So uh, next thing I'm thinking about is a history of African-American street vendors. 
because they did so much to shape the food scenes of places like New Orleans, uh, Savannah, Charleston, New York, Chicago. Um, and what I want to do is just show how they represented West Africa in the way they dressed, the way they carried their food, you know, toting it on their head and other things. Um, and the ways that ways that they did their street cries. Um, a lot of people argue that the way these street cries, so the way they got your attention when they wanted you to buy something from them are the precursors to the blues and jazz. Uh, and I want to show the West African uh, ingredients they introduced, um, how they created these new composed dishes, fusion dishes with things they experienced from people in the Americas. And then um, the really cool thing is in the late 1800s, uh, several people would listen to these street cries and they actually put them down to sheet music. And I have a collection of those. So I would love to get a book deal where I can put out a compendium piece of music where um, I would provide some context and then I would hire somebody to sing the street cries using the street music. So we would know what it was like in 1880s New Orleans to have somebody trying to buy your stuff. And I'm just gonna put it out there. If Beyonce wants to do a street cry on Lemonade, she can certainly be part of my collection. <laughs> <laughs> so you said that you should make me your publicist i thought you were about to say i should make you a meal and i was going to say absolutely oh that's all that's just given that's so all here so i just need to let you know that in march murph turns 80 and i think it's a perfect opportunity for you to show up to my kitchen again with that cast iron skillet that yes plan. but you know i'm going to make that spam masubi you know I'm going to make that, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to ask you about that. Uh, in uh, since the it's uh, the White House up to Obama, I wanted to find out if uh, you found out uh, if uh, the Obamas uh, had anything uh, on their menu that uh, you could say, "Boy, that that is from the Hawaiian Islands." All right, so I found that they did have a luau on the South Lawn in 2009. So I don't know if that's authentic, but uh, I could not find anything on the White House menu. I have the cookbook that Michelle Obama put out uh, about the White House garden and I didn't see anything there. So I have to do some more research, but I was looking at some articles online and evidently, you know, Obama frequently goes back to Hawaii. Oh well, yeah, yeah. He had something I've never heard of. So Merv, I want you to tell people what this is. He had something called a uh, lunch plate, a full oh, lunch yeah. plate. Oh, yeah. Plate so tell, tell me what that is. Lunch. Oh my God, yeah. Well, <laughs> scoop of rice, or maybe two scoop of rice, scoop of uh, a macaroni salad, uh, maybe some curry stew, maybe some teriyaki chicken, uh, and uh, you know some other side dishes. Uh, oh, that's a... Uh, traditional kind of uh, uh, Hawaiian uh, uh, lunch. And do you, do you know what the cultural exchange that brought that together? Do you know the story, the backstory? You know, I had a sense, and I, I can't tell you for sure, but I had a sense it came from those uh, uh, Japanese uh, okazuyas, where you would go to, we used to call them delis or delicatessens. And, and you would get a plate and you would pick what you wanted. Uh, so it was always an eclectic mix. It's just whatever they had and you would just- Right, but you usually, the base was usually two scoop rice and a, a scoop of uh, a macaroni salad. Okay, so this was serious carb loading. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. Okay, all right. <laughs> and then you have to explain the masubi. You have to explain that too. Musubi. Musubi. Spam musubi. Musubi. Yeah. Yeah, spam musubi. Uh, it's a uh, some rice. No, the really classy stuff uh, in the rice is an ume, which is a uh, pickled cherry. It's within the rice, and that's covered, uh, wrapped with uh, uh, seaweed. But I mean, then it's uh, some spam on there a slice of spam that's been uh, fried and then it's wrapped with uh, uh, the nori or the uh, black seaweed and uh, that is something uh, that uh, just about any uh, buddy from hawaii uh, knows how to make and uh, 
uh, right. figures on uh, almost uh, any uh, picnic menu. All right. Well, just for your birthday, I'm going to start practicing my spam with collard greens. Instead of instead of using smoked turkey, I'll, I'll put some spam in there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hawaii has the highest per capita intake of spam of anywhere in the United States. So nice. Hey, thanks for joining us, Guy. I really appreciate it. Thank you so nah, much. It was fun. Always good to talk to you. Thanks for uh, looping me in on this really interesting uh, conversation and topic. I didn't know, I had heard of Blackbirding, but I didn't know much about it. And I certainly had not seen that film. And I'll just close by saying this, that last scene where he's looking out in the ocean resonated for me, given the story of my ancestors. And one thing I hope to do before my life ends is, is make it to Senegal and some of those ports uh, where they're called the doors of no return and actually have that glance out into the Atlantic and and see what my enslaved ancestors, um, you know, last visions of their their freedom. Um, so I want does that resonate with me? So th thank you for uh, bringing that film to my attention. Oh, terrific! Thanks, appreciated it, and uh, thanks to all our folks at DMNS behind the scenes, and uh, thanks for everybody to, who joined us to Raven for. Uh, coming to represent the commission and as always the audience we appreciate it i mean that's why we do it right right <laughs> so aloha aloha all right peace